decide that you're going to stop learning when you graduate college and you'll become uneducated tomorrow, basically. So the whole idea of lifelong learning and learning from those around you is incredibly important. Any other life lessons that you want to share? Awfully shy. <laughs> Okay, I mean one of the most interesting things personally for me when I give speeches is just learning from the audience So I'll say that that's one of the things not necessarily the most important. It's hard to find one but realizing also that humility is Completely central for me being a lifelong learner That's something that I realized and the moment when I believe that I have nothing to learn from anyone else is I think kind of like what you said that's when I would become uneducated um, You know, so humility was something that is extremely central to me any other comments, life lessons? Oh, yes? Um, just understanding when you're dealing with people, where they're coming from, their context, such as your 16-year-old who's um, researched a lot of different ideas, and so that's where you're coming from, whereas we have been working here, and we have our context of uh, working at the National Laboratory. Mm -hmm. So understanding where people are coming from in order to dialogue with them on a, on a the basis. Right, okay, understanding where people are coming from, perfect. And oh. I'll share one as well. So building self-awareness of oneself. I think that's one that we often change over time and basically try to understand. Um, and we try to play certain roles and put ourselves in those roles mm -hmm. over time. So really trying to engage and understand yourself first yes. and foremost and who you are. Building self-awareness, understanding who you are first and foremost. These are all some incredible lessons, I think. And, oh yes. You know, one of the things that, uh, especially with teenagers, I mean, bringing up a child, I've found out that if you engage the child intellectually, you know, most parents do, what they do is they take the child to this class or this course or this, you know, they're basically doing the work of a chauffeur. That's not, that's not what I mean by engaging the child. But if you engage them intellectually, I think they learn a lot more and as a parent, I learn a lot. Like for example, if someone always wanted to learn, you know, study physics. I said, okay, you want to study physics, tell me what is space. Go find out, you don't, I don't know, you don't know. Go find out. So he would go and, you know, search everywhere, you know, Google up, <laughs> you know, and present me with what he found out. And right now, I, I'm proud to say that he knows almost as much physics as he is. That's incredible. I completely agree with you. Or, I'm really you know, like what is time? Taking that proactive role in parenting, really engaging intellectually with your children. Um, I can definitely remember moments when my parents did the exact same thing. and. I was reading um, Amy Traw's book, <laughs> which some of you might have read, Battle Him with the Tiger Mother, and she says somewhere in the book um, that she was in class and she was kind of struggling to feel as passionate about some of the issues, and she commented, my parents never discussed politics and philosophy with me at the, at the dinner table. You know, that just didn't happen. And I thought that's really sad, because what we need to be doing is we need to be engaging intellectually. My parents would just start conversations based on the things that we saw in the news, based on the books that we were reading, and they encouraged my sister and me to argue with them if we disagreed, if we could provide enough solid evidence, and it really taught me how to reason. And I think that being able to engage intellectually that proactively with my parents is one of the most valuable gifts that I've ever been given. When we think about all these life lessons, whether they're relating to parenting, learning, how we know ourselves, how we present ourselves, I think that it goes without saying that most of these things are things that we had to kind of come to. It, it wasn't something we could sit down in a class and get taught and get tested on. Um, and these are, I think, some of the things that make people extraordinarily valuable, their understanding of these lessons. So to emphasize the pervasive falsehood that we know what it means to be meritorious because of whether someone knows whether a passage is more bellicose or indignant, <laughs> I think that that drives a destructive attitude into our universities, our workplaces, and our lives that makes intelligence its highest virtue, to quote the author Christopher Hayes. And his writing about merit was really what inspired me quite a bit, and he said this, it isn't just a celebration of smartness that characterizes the culture of meritocracy, it's something more pernicious, a conviction that smartness is rankable, and that the hierarchy of intelligence, like the hierarchy of wealth, never plateaus. 
While smartness is necessary, it is far from sufficient. Wisdom, judgment, empathy, and ethical rigor are all as important, even if those traits are far less valued. Indeed, extreme intelligence without these qualities can be extremely destructive. But empathy does not impress the same way smartness does. Smartness dazzles and mesmerizes. I found this to be very poignant because going to high school, I realized, yeah, this is, this is true. When we look around and we think, who are you impressed by? Who is the kid you want to be? Then the juniors and sophomores that I talk to, they want to be the kid who got into Harvard. They don't want to be the kid who is on the courtyard cleanup crew and picking up napkins that other people have left behind and basically taking care of the school. So we do need to put so much more value on things that aren't tested, on things that maybe won't earn you immediate accolades or your next big job, but are extraordinarily important nevertheless. Many people will say that school is supposed to be preparation for society. And, school hands working, and society hands working adults the business equivalent of Scantrons and SATs. Competition and ranking systems like the kind of JP Morgan, which automatically fires the bottom 10% of workers. Uh, harsh, I know. Life, many say, is a rat race. But personally, I believe that we build what we want our society to be within our schools. Ultimately, I want a school, a family, and a culture that doesn't hand me a rat race, because I want a society that values me as more than a class rank, a score, a percentile. We value the people in our lives, I hope, not because of how they do on some objective scale, but because of who they are. People who eat and dance and love and cry and whose brief moment in the sun makes ours a little brighter. And I dare you to show me a test that can measure that. Maybe that's why Google's Laszlo Bach, who's senior vice president of people operations at Google, so basically in charge of hiring, said this, and obviously I don't necessarily agree with this statement, this was just off of a New York Times article about Google's hiring, and it's called How to Get a Job at Google, it's very interesting. Laszlo Bach said GPAs are worthless as a criteria for hiring, and test scores are worthless. We found that they don't predict anything. I realized that if Laszlo Bach, who's in charge of hiring for Google, is saying this, then all of these things that my classmates and I have pinned our hopes and dreams on, <laughs> <laughs> Basically, he's calling that worthless. And reading that article, it was a very harsh realization. Um, and then I read that Paper Tigers article, and Wesley Yang wrote this. It is part of the bitter undercurrent of Asian American life that so many Asian graduates of elite universities find that meritocracy as they have understood it comes to an abrupt end after graduation. If between 15 and 20% of every Ivy League class is Asian, and the Ivy Leagues are incubators for the country's leaders, it would stand to reason that Asians would make up some corresponding portion of the leadership class. And yet, Asian Americans represent roughly 5% of the population, but only 0.3% of corporate officers, less than 1% of corporate board members, and around 2% of college presidents. A third of all software engineers in Silicon Valley are Asian, and yet they make up only 6% of board members and about 10% of corporate officers of the Bay Area's 25 largest companies. And at the National Institutes of Health, where 21.5% of tenure-track scientists are Asian, only 4.7% of branch or lab directors are, according to a 2005 study. So there's clearly something happening. While there are extreme levels of educational attainment and amazing contributions in science going on, there are not as many leaders, there's not as many role models for young people to see who are at the top. And Google's Laszlo Bach noted, meanwhile, that the proportion of people without any college education at Google has increased over time, now as high as 14% on some teams. The fact that there are some teams at Google with 14% of folks working there and not having a college degree was pretty shocking to me as I read that article. But for most of my Asian American friends, the prospect of being part of that 14% is unthinkable. Because even if they were the best coders in the world, if they asked their parents if they could drop out of school <laughs> or simply not go to college in the first place, they would receive an unequivocal no. Why do something so risky, so out of the box, with such a tiny chance of succeeding? Now, not necessarily just with the decision to go to college or not, but the classes we take, or the paths prescribed to us, the jobs we're told to aspire to, the message that my peers often hear is this, work within the system, keep your head down, and don't make trouble. But the people who see their names in lights, 
and their companies shoot up and their experiments take hold are often the people who work outside the system or even challenge it. The head of the MIT Media Lab, Joy Ito, never went to college. And people are always shocked to hear this. I mean, the MIT Media Lab, that's a pretty big deal. But Joy is a great example of someone who could have gone the tra traditional route, could have gone and gotten a PhD, but didn't. And he's immensely successful today, despite that. Raise your hands if you've heard of the Teal Fellowship. Seeing some raised hands. Okay, so the Teal Fellowship is a $100,000 grant. It was set up by PayPal founder Peter Teal to encourage kids to either not go to college or to delay going to college. And there are 20 fellows selected every year in an extremely competitive uh, competition that includes detailed proposals, telephone interviews, and then this final cutthroat competition in the Art of Silicon Valley. Madison Maxey was a 20-year-old Teal Fellow who left school to design her own line of blazers, financed by backers on Kickstarter. The title of her project was Building a Brand in 365 Days, and she raised tens of thousands of dollars very quickly. In 2010, a teenager named Dale Stevens applied for the Teal Fellowship, and he started a movement called Uncollege. He wrote a book called How to Hack Your Education that became a bestseller, and he actually did indeed drop out of college. He today travels the world to talk about alternatives and the importance of real-world learning. So the message that I hear from things like the Teal Fellowship, Dale Stevens, Madison Maxey, and others is extraordinarily different from the one that I heard growing up. And the message that I heard growing up was an expectation, not even an expectation, just an assumption, that my sister and I would go to college. It was an assumption because it was an assumption that we wanted to be successful. It was an assumption that we wanted a good place in society. And it was an assumption of my parents and everyone else's that college was the first prerequisite. I started organizing TEDx Redmond when I was in ninth grade, and one of the kids I met through organizing that was named Mohammed Adib. And he started designing apps for Android phones. He actually uh, made a lot of money off of that. They were bestsellers. And because of his work, he was offered an interview on Google's campuses before he had even graduated high school. So what I'm seeing from people like this, people like Dale and Muhammad and Madison and all these others who have traveled the world and debated education issues at TED and sold best-selling apps and gotten interviews at Google, is that it is possible to find success outside of conventional systems. And it is possible to do it very creatively, and I think that parents should take note. Which is not to say that everyone should suddenly drop out of college, decide to you know, go do a startup in Silicon Valley, because that path isn't for everyone. But as I did ask at the beginning of this talk, where will the next Steve Jobs come from if his parents won't let him drop out of school? <laughs> I think that we need more role models who are defying conventional paths. We need to look up to people like Joy Ito and realize that, yeah, there is no one single path that will be right for every single person. But we also need more role models, period. My friend Jessica Jang, the girl that I quoted at the beginning of this talk, said that the turning point, the moment when she stopped hating her Asian-ness, was when she began watching a TV show called Avatar. <laughs> and she said that that was the turning point because of this. Oops, I don't have the quote, apparently. Um, it was just, uh, I think the turning point for me personally was watching Avatar, which has all Asian characters, many of them dark-skinned, and all of them very cool and well-developed. All I had as a kid before I intentionally started seeking out diverse media was like Cho Chang, the Harry Potter character. <laughs> Personally, media is huge for me, and it's a pretty important part in improving wider social perceptions. I agree. Two of my close friends, who are both Chinese American girls, have told me that on multiple occasions their parents have told them, speak more quietly, don't make as many jokes, and don't argue. Maybe that's what docility and some antiquated definition of femininity require. But obedience and quietness, humorlessness, and non-confrontation are not going to be the traits of the next Fortune 500 CEO, television star, or president of the United States. So we need to change the image of what it means to be Asian American, not just in media, not just so that young people around the world have more people who look like them to look up to, but we need to change that image at home. That's where it starts. However, the things I've discussed are not necessarily specific only to Asian American Pacific culture because this talk was never just about being Asian at all. Forget that childhood desire to be white. Forget my long-held desire for role models and leadership who looked like me. Forget for a moment my heritage and realize that this is bigger than any one ethnicity. This is about challenging something far deeper. 
the underlying idea that merit is a single score, a single grade, a single school you get into, a single place you go to work, a single anything. Creating schools and workplaces that embrace independence and innovation, being adventurous enough to rebel against the status quo expectations or credentials and test scores, and highlighting positive media images of diverse people in leadership roles. All of this helps to promote the idea that the strength of a society comes from the diversity of ways in which we define merit and reward it. No economy of diverse individuals can flourish if we do not find merit in wider expressions of excellence beyond smartness and academics. As we learn to recognize and reward the value of a broader spectrum of human talents and skills, we in turn expand, advance, and diversify our financial systems, the richness of our shared way of life, and the quality of our existence. It starts with us, and I strongly believe we can do it. As you all can tell, this is the reason why I wanted her to come and talk to me. <laughs> She's a quite remarkable uh, young lady, and um, I was very honored uh, to be in the audience to see her at her first speech. Um, she has a uh, hit on some things that we've talked about here at this laboratory quite a bit. And, you know, I appreciate your knowledge and your perspective in bringing that to us from, sorry, but such a young age. <laughs> but you captured so much um, and actually infused a lot of the things that we've talked about and questioned in our own minds about how we actually engage young people and, and how do we actually try to look at this notion of merit, because it is very important to us here at this laboratory. And it has been for a long time. It's still going to be for a very long time. However, how can we change our landscape a little bit more so we can receive a lot more of our young people and have, give them the innovative tools and things? Because we've given it to them at home. And as a result, they need that still, that energy, that, what, that level and engagement at all throughout the day, not just at home. And unfortunately, we're going to have to figure that out as we move forward. Uh, it's going to be a hard change for us as a laboratory to culturally change that landscape, but I think it's one that we could really <laughs> look to. So um, I want to give about five minutes or so if you all have any questions of this wonderful young lady and uh, let the questions begin um, and would you mind uh, repeating the questions yeah. just so our cameras can catch it. 